Welcome Divanauts to Cronista de Indias, the YouTube channel dedicated to Latin American studies by Professor Andrea Lorena Fernandez from Pace University in New York City. Uh, as of yesterday, I began to add in daily content to the Instagram account, so please use the channel link to head over there and follow me on Instagram so you can get daily dose of Latin American culture. In the last episode of Season 1, Episode 11, Policarpa Salabarrieta, La Pola, Colombia's independence seamstress spy, we reviewed the, this incredible diva's biography and dove into her representations in pop culture. She exhibits the six traits of a revolucionaria, Juana or Rabona. These are contraband, family affairs, meaning that they were associated or working closely with relatives who were in the patriot or royalist cause, intelligence, seduction or getting soldiers from one team to the surf for the other team and a support troops so those are the uh sorry but those were five okay we'll make it five never mind that's why i teach history not math no okay uh still in the heat of 1800 to 1830 revolutionary period this particular episode of latin american divas we pull away from the famous characters like la pola to focus on what umberto eco calls microhistoria or microhistory. In the last episode, we did, we did not delve into Pola's judicial proceedings, for example, in Bogota, to give lesser known diva a chance to have the YouTube stage right here on Cronista de Indias. This episode's lesson it plan is titled The Case of Carmen Camacho, Seducer of Royalist Troops in Mexico, 1811. And it focuses on four subtopics. One, we're going to do a brief introduction of Miguel Hidalgo's anti-Spanish revolts of 1810. Two, we're going to study Spanish jurisprudence during the period of Latin American revolutions as it applied to revolucionarias, not only in Mexico, but in Latin America and across the Spanish Empire. Three, we're going to talk about the royalists under siege and how come Carmen Camacho's case evidences that the Spanish are quaking in their boots. Uh, four, we're going to read a brief passage from Insurgent Women and Ardent Revolutionaries by Rebecca Early in the collection by Pamela S. Murray, cur uh, curated and edited by Pamela S. Murray, Women and Gender in Modern Latin America. So let's get to back into the script. So, a brief introduction of Miguel Hidalgo's anti-Spanish revolts of 1810. Um, Miguel Hidalgo had genuine sympathy for the Native Americans and was interested in free thought, science, and industrial development. This may be attached to the Age of Enlightenment. And he claimed to be leading a revolt on behalf of King Ferdinand. That is uh, pretty much everybody's claim all across the continent of how they rose against the, low, uh, the interim Spanish government by Joseph Bonaparte. Yes, he's related to Napoleon, um, Napoleon's brother in Spain, and they claim to be fighting on behalf of King Ferdinand, and that's how their revolt uh, imploded or exploded, or, well, that's how it all began. That was the catalyst. In 1810, Miguel Hidalgo called on insurgents during mass and marched into the mining city of Guanajuato under the banner of the Virgin of Guadalupe. The rebels looted stores, crops, seized municipal granaries, killed peninsulares and creoles indiscriminately, and the rebel masses were hard to command. Um, he refused to take Mexico City, fearing that they would repeat the rape and pillage of Guanajuato in a much larger setting and context. Hidalgo instituted some reforms, which included abolished slavery and Indian tribute. He wanted to return communal lands to the Indians, and he was a popular character of these revolts was absent from the rest of Latin American uprisings. Uh, he attempted to escape into the United States but was captured and executed, leaving Mexican sovereignty as an uncompleted project. In the wake of this and similar events across Latin America, mainly people claiming to be um, taking over local power on behalf of dispossessed King Ferdinand, how nice of them, uh, royalist authorities dealt harshly with all perceived allies or sympathizers of the insurgents. So let's get to point number two. Spanish jurisprudence or law, Spanish law right here, we have Andres Bello, massive lawyer, um, during the period of Latin American revolutions, as it applied to revolucionarias, 
across the entire Spanish Empire. This particular case that we're going to read about takes place on December 4th to 6th, 1811 in Acambaro, Mexico. So we're going to review the plaintiff, the defendant, and the veredict. The plaintiff is Dragoon Jose Maria Garcia. This 24-year-old dragoon of Don Fernando Antonel's company, or a mercenary company, receives, presumably, an invitation by a lady to join her in Sitacuru, uh, the Patriot headquarters in Mexico City. She insists that he brings arms and companions, and he followed her home and had her arrested. Uh, he is a literate soldier, very important to know. And of his testimony, we I can read off a little piece of his testimony right here. He says, quote, Lastly, she stated that the witness should understand that he turned her over to the authorities and she became condemned to hang, she would be saved and he instead condemned. At this time, about half the past seven in the, mo in the evening, noticing that the woman was quite inebriated, the witness tried to leave but found it necessary to accompany her to her house where he left her while offering to take her next day to meet six other dragoons who also were thinking of desertion. She offered to find him at the barracks at 8 o'clock in the morning the following day." Unquote. So from this passage, we must know that there is uh, the role of gender in shaping perceptions of criminality is really obvious here. Uh, number one, Carmen Camacho presumably threatens Jose Maria that she will turn him in for a traitor. Number two, she becomes so inebriated that he has to take her home instead of going back to the barracks himself. How nice of a gentleman is he? Now, do you really believe that a Juana Rabona, a recruiter for the Patriot or Royalist forces, would become inebriated so much that she's vulnerable to and needs to be taken home? I don't necessarily buy it. So let's say what the defendant, Doña Carmen Camacho, responds with. Carmen's testimony is much, much, much more different. She is approached by the dragoon in her story. And for this, we have the section right here. We're going to go ahead and read. She said that about five o'clock in the afternoon of the day she encountered Jose Maria Garcia, accompanied by dragoon Castro, both of whom invited the defendant and another woman who was with her, Juana Crisostomo, to a wine shop where, in fact, they went and drank liquor. So notice that in this version of it, um, Carmen is accompanied by a wing woman, Juana, and it's very likely that most uh, recruiters for Patriot or Royalist forces were not working alone. They would have a wing woman. She added that a short while later, Dragon Castro left and that the defendant remained with Garcia and the other woman. She stated that Garcia told the defendant that he was disgusted with this regimen and that he wanted to go to Isitacuro. She responded that she was not going to Sitacruz since she feared that the dragoon Francisco Barreda, with whom she had left San Luis, would return to the army and would reproach her for not returning home. At this, she continued, Garcia proceeded to tell her that he wasn't going to Sitacruz either. He asked if she knew that the insurgents could kill those that stayed there. She responded that she had seen that they did not kill those born in America. This is part of the Hidalgo revolts. They only kill criollos and peninsulares. So it's very likely that Carmen Camacho is a mestiza, which is why she's working with Miguel Hidalgo. And that if he did not want to go, he could stay here, adding that whenever the army left, the insurgents came in. She then left with Garcia and the other woman who accompanied her and went, and the three went to her house. So in this version of the story, Juana Crisostomo accompanies Carmen Camacho back home along with Jose Maria Garcia. Camacho is not inebriated to the point of losing her consciousness, unlike in the previous story. There, Garcia suggested that just the two of them go out again, but she said no, at which point she might that he might stay the night in that house. She did not want him to, however, because as she stated, the landlady would not like it. He then threatens saying that he would turn him in, her in for being an insurgent. Taking it as a joke, she told him to do as he pleased, adding that soldiers knew very well that she was not an insurgent. The said dragoon then took his leave and she remained home. So in Carmen Camacho's version, 
The dragoon takes her home and insists on going out with her. When she turns him down, he threatens to turn her in for being a seducer of troops. So let's see if I miss anything. Uh, Carmen Camacho is actually illiterate, so she's facing somebody that can read and write and a judicial system that she's probably not familiar with. She signs with an X. Um, her story seems to be one of teamwork. Patriot seducers did not work alone. We already mentioned that she's working with a so-called Juana Crisostomo, and they remain together in the tavern and go home together. She's the wife of Juan Albino de Herrera, so she is married. Um, she accuses Garcia of, of being displeased with the Royalist Regiment and wants to join the Patriots. And her brother is an adjutant to the insurgents, so she is connected to the Patriot cause, even though in her testimony she denies it. Uh, and her husband, who is also a Patriot soldier, so, so even at the tribunal she tries to downplay her connections to the Patriot cause. So we're going to read the verdict, and uh, I hope this doesn't upset you too much. <laughs> Find out what happens to poor Carmen. Nothing can be more prejudicial to the army than the fact that women devote themselves to seducing its members and deceiving them by telling them fantastical tales, thus contributing to them forsaking their flag and increasing the number of foolish traitors. It is therefore incumbent upon us a fitting punishment on her who, having lost sight of her duties, has committed this crime. So um, she is, uh, sed by seducing, she has betrayed the moral and gender order of things. On the basis of the testimony taken from three witnesses, Carmen Camacho is thoroughly convicted not only of having seduced Dragoon Jose Maria Garcia to desert and join the insurgents, but of strongly urging others to accompany him and take arms, in addition to facilitating their leaving. Therefore, although she insists that she did not vary her statements, her crime is proven by fact of which there is no doubt, since even those with whom she lived corroborated. That Dragoon Garcia was at her house the morning of the 3rd, speaking with her, a fact she did not cease to deny, even under pressure. This attests to the malicious nature of her motives, and further confirms her crime of seduction, in accordance with the laws that define her as a genuine traitor to the king and the fatherland, she must suffer the penalty of execution. Should your honor see fit, you can order that penalty be imposed. Acámbaro, December 6, 1811. Licenciado José Francisco Nava. So, Carmen Camacho is sentenced to hang and be executed, even though there is no proof beyond the three witnesses that accompany José María uh, José María García. The testimony of the so-called Juana Crisóstomo uh, is never sought out, but if she was working for the Patriot cause, it's likely that she booked it when her teammate Carmen Camacho is taken prisoner by the Royalists. So we should note out of this last verdict that they say nothing can be more prejudicial than women seducing men from one army to the other. They are really, really scared of desertion. Uh, she does not deny that she's doing this even under pressure, which makes us assume, and maybe rightly so, that she was tortured into giving this testimony. Uh, the malicious nature of her motives tie her gender to the fall of Adam and being somewhat naturally malicious. Oh, poor us. Uh, she is seen as a genuine traitor, and she's executed with a placard on her chest that denotes her crime. This is the third topic right now. The royalists are clearly under siege. You know they're shaking in their boots when they start capturing spies and producing evidence against them. That is not really evidence. Even they must have known that. Carmen Camacho accuses the tithe collector of giving tax money to the insurgents. Uh, store owners and hacendados voluntarily give supply and horses to the insurgents as well. So it's a whole network of urban people who are supplying the insurgents, not just her, and yet she is the only one that is hung, you know, horrible. Uh, she also denies storing weapons in her house. We're now going to read a small passage from Rebecca Early. Uh, yes, this one is from Insurgent Women and Ardent Revolutionaries by Rebecca Early. There we go. We're going to give it a bit, um, a bit of a go. So, voluntarily or involuntarily, Colombian women, in this case, 
this may be interchangeable with Mexican women because there are parallel events. Both La Pola and Carmen Camacho are contemporaries living similar circumstances in different parts of the empire. So, Colombian women equipped both royalists and republicans with clothing, food, nurse ailing soldiers, provided information, articulated opinions, occasionally participated in armed combat. Many women, in other words, engaged actively with the political and military upheavals of 1810 to 1825. Acting publicly should be interpreted broadly. Soliciting funds, soliciting funds for the troops should certainly be seen as public political act. However, even an activity as uncontroversial as volunteering to sew, sew uniforms might bear some political charge. As Linda Coley remarked in the, of the anti-Napoleonic sewing circles in England, this form of public sewing represented, quote, the thin edge of a far more radical wedge, unquote. Speaking of British women, Coley notes, quote, By extending their solicitude to the nation's armed forces, men who were not in the main related to them by blood or marriage, women demonstrated that their domestic virtues possessed a public as well as a private relevance. Consciously or not, these female patriots were staking out a civic role for themselves, unquote. In Colombia, and we add Mexico, too, the war allowed some women, consciously or unconsciously, to stake out a civic role for themselves. Precisely what that civic role might be was another matter. Alright, so in conclusion, in this episode 12 of Latin American Divas, we dedicated it to Carmen Camacho, a seducer of Rolius troops for the Patriot cause in Mexico. We've explored we explored her story using Umberto Eco's theory of microhistory by learning about lesser known revolucionarias like Mexico's Carmen Camacho. We shed light on neighboring historical figures like Colombia's La Pola, who would represent in this case macrohistory, to reconstruct women's collective experience during the independence period. In this episode, we examined one a brief introduction to Miguel Hidalgo's revolts of 1810. Two, we talked about Spanish law and how it applied to women during the independence period. We talked about royalists feeling the pressure and being under siege. And we read a little passage from Rebecca Earle to show how to contextualize the role of women in the war effort. In the next episode, which is titled Angela Batallas, A Slave Woman's Freedom and Patriotism in Independence Era Ecuador. Yes, Ecuador, you're getting your own diva. Oh my God, I am so excited. Oh. My co-teacher at Pace University is going to be all over this. Um, we take a closer look at research by Camila Townsend. So here's a little passage, quote, Whatever the guards might have thought, she had not come there either to engage in any kind of sexual relations with the liberator or to accuse him of being the father of her child. No, she had come there to make a plea and a statement. She wanted her freedom, unquote. An illiterate Afro-Ecuadorian woman defies social, the judicial code to free her mestiza daughter, Maria del Carmen. So this is a story about a mother and a daughter using the enlightenment and the flavor of the rights of men and applying it to themselves and preaching to the choir, preaching to Simon Bolivar about it. Thank you for taking the time to learn about Latin American divas right here at Cronista de Indias, where new episodes drop every Friday. Please hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And as always, thank you a million for viewing, liking, and sharing these episodes. As always, like the poster says, you gotta do epic shit. Have a wonderful afternoon. This episode is filmed on 4th of July. So happy 4th of July, USA. Happy birthday.